Hi everyone, this is Jackie Cooper with Crypto Mom 2 and um, today I am so excited because I love talking about the blockchain and cryptocurrency and I also love talking about um, how we can support each other and the, the jobs and the possibility of what's going on within the crypto space, the blockchain space. Today I have a very special guest on, um, Robert Edwards, who is going to talk about um, a lot of how people can get involved with working within this space. And we'll talk about that in a quick second. But for those that might not be familiar with Crypto Mom 2, I just wanna uh, share a little bit about my journey and how um, I got started. Um, the talk show was started last year and I'm very excited about it because it is a documentation of both my learning about cryptocurrency and blockchain, as well as the interviews and the, the chats that I've had with those that are a lot more experienced and knowledgeable um, in this community. And um, what the talk show you know, covers both non-fungible tokens and what's going on in that space, altcoins, what's going on in that space, Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin, just um, technology developments, commercial uh, commerce, everything. So um, it's all about exploring, sharing and growing and learning. So with that, I want to, um, you know, welcome Robert uh, to the Crypto Mom 2. And uh, he's actually all the way over in Scotland. And um, I'm, you know, that's what's wonderful about this show. We're able to talk to people all over the world who are in this community. Robert, welcome today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Jackie. I absolutely appreciate being on the show today. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm based in, in sunny Edinburgh, Scotland, which is a very nice change. Uh, typically, it's, uh, it rains a lot during the year here. So once we have a nice summer, it's always important to make the most of it. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce um, the, your company? And also, uh, for those that are listening, about three times during our talk show, we will be talking about how you can reach out to Robert if you, you know, would like to connect with him. And that information will also be in the block below. So definitely, um, you know, if you don't have a paper and pen, it's okay. Just remember CryptoMon2 and come on back to this episode. But Robert, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and the company and how they can reach you? Yeah, of course, more than happy to do so. So uh, I work for a company called Enterprise Digital Resources, or EDR for short. And, you know, what we are really is a specialist recruitment firm. Um, we have, I guess, two core business units, the first being blockchain technology. Um, I'm part of the blockchain team over here in Edinburgh, Scotland. And within that team, um, we, we come across, I guess, three primary sorts of clients that we engage with. Um, the first one being the successful or the fast growth startup. Um, this is the most common common sort of company within the blockchain space right now. Um, typically, you know, they come into the industry and they're looking to develop new, novel, innovative solutions to, I guess, counter some of the challenges which we see, um, whether it's within sort of DeFi space or even the NFT ecosystem as well. Um, and what they're typically looking to do is attract talent, whether it's uh, technical or, or product focused leaders who can come in and really help deliver against their product roadmaps. Um, the second type of client that we would typically engage with is, you know, your blockchain or your crypto VC. Uh, so it's, it's a slightly different sort of relationship, you know, I think, and, and that sort of scenario, what those kinds of clients are really looking for is to establish relationships within the blockchain and crypto space, but also identify and attract, you know, talent for their portfolio companies as well. Um, where we bring value in that sort of process is we have an extensive network of companies which we work with, and we facilitate the process of establishing those longstanding business relationships, um, some of which have, have, have bared quite significant fruits. Um, and then, you know, the third kind of company which we'd engage with on the blockchain team is very much your enterprise level clients. So we're talking about your traditional financial institutes who maybe say five, six, seven years ago didn't have a footing within the blockchain space, but have recognized the value of the technology in itself and are looking to integrate that into their service offerings. Um, where we bring value in that process is, you know, we help them secure talent for their, their innovation hubs and ultimately contribute towards, you know, extending their service offerings to, I guess, primarily clients within the, the DeFi space, but the, tra the traditional um, service users. Beyond the blockchain unit at ADR, we have also got, you know, a digital transformation team, which is based over in Belgium. 
they're much more established. They've been around for a much longer time. They've got a wealth of experience, um, but they primarily focus on working with enterprise level clients who are looking to either innovate or modernize their services and, and their processes. Um, the value that they bring is they have extensive experience in recruiting contractors as well. And, you know, they've, they've had success in placing those contractors in, role, in roles ranging from CRM um, to ERP, which is enterprise resource planning, as well as business innovation. So I think if we're looking at the dynamic of the team, it's a very good blend of, you know, seasoned pros within the recruitment space who have that experience in, I guess, more traditional tech stacks, but also younger guys like myself who sort of come in, um, not straight out of university, we've had some working experience, but we've, we, it's always been within the sort of consultancy fintech space. And then we've transitioned into blockchain technology. So effectively what that means is, you know, we've got our ear to the ground um, on the blockchain team. We're very much engaged with the market, tracking and tracing candidates on a daily basis. But then we can also go to those more senior guys when it comes to technical guidance, um, establishing business relationships because business development is another aspect of our service offering beyond you know recruitment we establish relationships with companies where we see value and i think you know in terms of our growth projections as well we've seen pretty much doubles in our revenue year and end which is reflective of the demand within the space but also i think the value that we bring to uh, the clients and companies within our network so I love what you're sharing. This is so, so rich with a lot of information. Um, how did you come to be at this company and what's your background? Yeah, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm always really happy to share my background because I think a lot of the time people go into education and they feel, you know, I've got to follow this, this one career path. And if I deviate from that, then, you know, I'm, I'm falling short. Um, so for myself, I'm very much uh, someone who's always looking to do something innovative, something new. Um, my, my first degree was in international business because I've got a really strong business acumen, developing relationships, um, identifying opportunities in market spaces were things that always really attracted me. And so when I completed my undergraduate degree, I realized that perhaps I wasn't as prepared to go into the workspace as I thought I was, um, given the dynamics at the time. So I decided to undertake a master's degree program, and that was in a strategic project management. And I think, you know, what that really taught me was the other side of things. Um, understanding things from a client's perspective, how things like time, cost, and quality factors, you know, are incorporated into business decisions and also hiring processes as well. Um, upon completion of that, that program, I moved into, I guess, the financial consultancy space um, within the UK. So I worked at a pretty large company, interacting with a lot of companies within sort of STEM sectors um, and acquiring innovation funding. That was interesting in itself because it exposed me to things like AI and robotics, you know, machine learning, and then eventually blockchain technology later down the line. And so I thought, you know, this is a fantastic market space. It's, it's, it's relatively untapped from a recruitment perspective. There are a lot of companies who are looking to develop these products, but ultimately there's a, there's a lack of talent within the market. And effectively what that causes is, a, I guess, a, a, a flux in demand and also a flux in what you can expect in relation to compensation expectations if you're a developer within the space. So from my perspective, um, I thought it would really be a good opportunity to, to delve into the market a little bit deeper. Um, fortunately for me, I had one or two contacts within my network who were primarily operating within the tech recruitment space. And as it just so happened, you know, one of my contacts was actually looking to set up a, a blockchain specific team here in Edinburgh, Scotland, which is a fantastic opportunity for me as well. So um, based on that, you know, I hopped on board about a year or so ago and, you know, when I look at the market back then to now, I think that the shift has been absolutely fantastic. We're seeing a lot more, a lot more DeFi protocols, um, a lot more NFT companies cropping up as well, which is fantastic because I think if we look at you know the traditional, I guess applications of blockchain technology, a lot of people associate it with you know traditional, I guess finance, um, but with the NFT space, it really creates an avenue for younger people to engage with the technology in itself. So. I think that pretty much summarizes, you know, my my entry route into the industry. I understand exactly what you're saying in terms about the development uh, within the blockchain. And one of the things that I um, created as a resource, and this is also another reason why we connected as well, I created the NFT Academy Rolodex. So that way individuals who are in the NFT space who um, 
have certain skill sets can be matched with both um, colleges and universities that would like to use them as instructors for the next generation, as well as um, in, uh, companies that are um, looking for um, individuals that have those skill sets that um, I can then like share over with you to say that this person, you know, has this capability, you know, you might have a company that would like to connect with them. I, uh, you know, um, in terms of how old is the comp your company, the company that you're working with? Of course, so EDR has been operational now since 2018. So wow. not, I guess not, not an extensive amount of time, but you know, within this industry, I think time flies by very, very quickly. Very um, so. we've, been, we've been able to establish a position in the market, which is, I would say unrivaled with, with other recruitment consultancies. I think if we're talking about, you know, specialist companies who have their, their ear to the ground on the blockchain space, there's maybe one or two other competitors within the market, but I think you know where we have value is within our team. We've got people from 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 varying backgrounds as well. We're capable as well of speaking multiple languages. So, um, although we are based in Edinburgh, Scotland, you know we've got a very good network of clients and candidates within the U.S., um, but also in South America as well, as well as Africa, you know, Central and Eastern Europe, and even you know APAC as a whole. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much a summary. So you've covered a lot. What is what are some of the skill sets that you're looking for? Um, you know, obviously, um, someone that might be in one industry could apply their uh, apply their talents to another industry. So um, when you're looking at an individual um, for as a possible candidate, what are you looking for? Of course, I think, you know, when I'm looking at individuals, it very much depends on the requirements I'm working on at the time, you know, typically. Um, the, the marketplace is very much, I would say, candidate driven as opposed to client driven, which is quite rare. Um, you don't see that in a lot of industries, but where I specialize is, is placing those sort of C-suite, senior level sorts of candidates. Um, those people who, you know, they might currently be engaged in a role, they're not actively looking, they've got a very comfortable situation. And then, you know, I guess my, my role in that is establishing relationships with them, um, identifying what their key motivators are when they're assessing opportunities and then presenting roles to them in a way, you know, that are in line with what they're looking for. But to take it back to your initial question, which is you know, what you're looking for in candidates, I think you know, the, the, the key skill which I'm finding coming across right now is you know, blockchain, specifically Solidity smart contract developers as well. Um, for those who are not really aware of what Solidity is, it's the sort of the smart contracting language for the Ethereum blockchain, which obviously a lot of the development work is happening upon right now. Um, the people who are capable of writing those Solidity smart contracts are typically in high demand simply because you know it, like i said it is i would say ethereum is i guess the most popular ecosystem for development right now and ultimately you don't have a lot of people who are capable of delivering on these large highly scalable applications that would be required so um finding those sorts of profiles right now is, is, is very much in demand but beyond that you know i think there's also a an emphasis for, for product focused roles as well. So within my network, I'm coming across quite a lot of you know, requirements for companies who are looking for maybe product managers or project managers. So people who have those experiences and you know, building out long-term strategic product roadmaps and also delivering against those. Um, so you know, if you're someone who even comes from an engineering background, but you've transitioned into more product focused roles as well, I think that in itself always puts your profile in a much more advantageous position within the blockchain space because not only are you in tune with you know the the deliverable side of things but you also have a really good technical acumen and i think you know companies like to engage with people who can have technical conversations so from my perspective i'll probably say those are the two primary areas where i'm seeing a lot of demand for right now so um how do I we we when we were talking last week, um, we were talking about sometimes it's difficult to verify someone's background. Um, how do you do that um, when someone approaches you and says, "I'm interested in uh, having um, you consider me as a candidate for"? Um, what do you ask them for? Yeah, of course, I think I think that's a really good question itself. I mean, you know. I'd say we we proactively approach candidates as opposed to you know dealing with inbound leads. We do have a lot of people approached on opportunities, and every now and then you do come across I would say a, a gem within the blockchain space. But our process is very much you know 
it's 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 very standard practice. So you know we have a, a variety of tools which we use to identify candidates, and we'll talk about that later in the conversation, I'm sure. And typically, what we do is we identify you know consec. I guess, track records in history. So you would look at things like consistent employment. How long has this person been employed at each, each employer? You know, typically a probationary period here in the UK lasts around six months. So if I'm looking at someone's profile and, you know, they're job hopping every maybe six to eight months, I think it's representative of the fact that maybe they haven't been able to deliver in, in their previous roles. Um, beyond that, I also look at, you know, the company profiles in themselves as well, because some clients within the blockchain space uh, are open to candidates from enterprise level backgrounds, but a lot of people are looking for those people who have experience within startups environments who are not scared of taking risks and are also, you know, comfortable being in a, in a small agile team whereby you have a lot of responsibility placed on you. Um, I think candidates from those sorts of backgrounds tend to have a really good opportunity within the space simply because, you know, it's demonstrative of the fact that they've come into a project, they've been able to deliver to some degree, before they decide to transition somewhere else. And I guess beyond looking at things like employment history and the company profiles in themselves, I think it's also really good to have conversation with candidates as well. Um, because I think I'm right now I'm, I'm in a position whereby I'm, I'm fairly adept at having technical conversations and you can kind of suss out people who, you know, maybe might be fluffing up their profiles or they just simply haven't done what they said they've done. But I think, yeah. you know, um, there is no, one process of, of validating a candidate's criteria within the space, which is, you know, it's quite challenging, especially because it is tech as well. I think in, in most other fields, um, you have very good barometers and measures of, on, on how to evaluate candidates. So definitely moving forward, I think that's something that will be very beneficial within the blockchain space. But I think right now where the market is, we're, we're not at that phase whereby we have that level of maturity where we can have sort of a, a standardized process. But definitely, I think moving forward, you know, it's something that from a recruiter's perspective would be beneficial. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, shortening the, the lead time between candidates being identified, putting them through an interview process, and then determining whether or not that process was successful in itself. What trend do you see um, happening within the, the blockchain community? Where do you see the biggest, you did, you've mentioned some of the needs, but where do you see some of these needs going and where do you see that we need to be developing the, uh, the next generation pool of candidates that are for the companies that are in development or are already in existence? Yeah, of course, and I think the good thing about blockchain right now is pretty much it's moving in, in, in two different directions. Obviously, we've got DeFi, which is the, the more common use case for blockchain technology. Um, for those who may not be aware, DeFi stands for decentralized finance. So pretty much, you know, you've got your traditional financial institutes like banks, but also we've got these, I guess, decentralized platforms as well, who allow you to exchange digital assets, fiat currencies, as well as, you know, precious metals and equities. I think that in itself is where the greatest demand is within blockchain, um, simply because it has, the, it has the biggest use case right now. That's that's just a matter of fact. It's, it's not an issue for dispute. But recently, and like I said earlier on, we've seen a, a really big shift in the market dynamic towards the NFT space, um, whereby you know we've got a lot of these companies who are developing these non-fungible tokens um, where they could be you know digital representations of arts. And you might think to yourself, you know, what is having a, uh, a GIF of, of, of a piece of art mean for me, but I think it's that security element of it as well. Um, if you look back, I don't know, maybe 180 years ago, um, you know, it was it was difficult to to verify authentic pieces of art or 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 music or or design, you know. But you know, having these smart contract solutions incorporated um, into, I guess, these NFT based solutions really helps validate. You know, when you're buying things, you're buying value, you're buying the real thing, and I think that in itself has resonated with a lot more retail based consumers of this technology. Um, so people who don't necessarily have an interest in finance can actually make use of blockchain, and I think that in itself is is really exciting. So um, you had mentioned tools that you use. Um, you want to talk about that? Yeah, of course, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to share the tricks of the trade. I think over here at EDR, we're kind of well-placed. We use a lot of best-in-class tools, I'd like to say, um, to aid our recruiters in their recruitment endeavors, but also to ensure that you know they maximize um, their time effectively. So I think the first and most important basic tool we make use of is a link, the LinkedIn recruiter profile. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic tool for first and foremost, you know, identifying candidates who are open to opportunities on the market, because 
Um, LinkedIn does have those features whereby, you know, if you're looking for jobs, you can highlight that on your profile. And what Recruiter does is it aggregates all that information based on candidates who have similar skill sets to what you're looking for. Um, so we can incorporate Boolean searches, say if I'm looking for a blockchain developer, for example, based in Argentina, I would type in, you know, blockchain developer based in Argentina who matches, you know, the tech stack I'm looking for. And then it would come up with a number of candidates who are openly looking for opportunities. But beyond that as well, it's also very good at, at, I guess, you know, bulk emailing people, bulk messaging a lot of people as well, because ultimately within the blockchain space and recruitment as a whole, you know, it's, it's very much numbers game. You might find 10 candidates who match what you're looking for, but it's a question of whether or not your opportunity matches what they're looking for. Um, so it would be an ineffective use of time if, you know, I was sending messages to every single person directly on LinkedIn message or hoping for a response um, without any visibility on that process. And I think, you know, what Recruiter does is it allows, it filters opportunities for candidates as well. So if they're not interested in something, then, you know, they're not being inundated by messages, but also it gives me visibility on, on where they're at in terms of, I guess, their hunt for opportunities. Um, beyond the Recruiter tool, uh, we also make use of uh, an ATS or CRM tool called Venturi, which I discussed with you a little bit last time as well. I think it's probably one of the, the key tools in our arsenal right now. And what that really allows you to do, similar to Rolodex, is really, I guess, aggregate or accumulate information on companies as well as candidates. So typically, if I'm on the candidate side, you know, if we have a conversation with people, um, we upload their CVs or their profiles onto our system. Um, it collates all the information and batches candidates who have similar profiles into talent pools. That way, when you're looking for a specific skill set, rather than running a, an extensive search on LinkedIn, we can simply go back to our database and identify candidates who, you know, match what we're looking for. And then in that instance, it's really just a case of reestablishing that connection with them, um, identifying if they're still open to opportunities and then initiating that process. You know, and then we take it to the client side of things. Um, one thing that Cherry is really, really good at doing is, I guess, um, allowing you to reach out to multiple contacts at the same time. It's you've got some, I guess, some some functions in there that um, allow you to change things like client names, company names, and then really just reach out to people and people in bulk, but also identify who key stakeholders are within the company, um, financial information, as well as. I guess, information on the products and services that they're developing. So not only do you have a database of companies as well, but you also have an extensive catalog of blockchain specific projects. And then I think, you know, beyond those sorts of tools, we make use of global VoIP services as well. I think, you know, establishing contacts with people across the world can be quite challenging, especially if you're trying to do it off mobile. Um, there's no need to run up phone bills. So we make use of some pretty good VoIP providers. One of them is a company called 8x8. Um, we have an 8x8 account for a company account, and we've got several users on that. That allows us to make calls inbound, but also receive in outbound calls, but receive inbound calls from pretty much people all over the world, really. And that, see, that's, I'd probably say, and from a communication perspective, is the most efficient way um, in which we establish contact. So how does, how does the corporate client find you? Um, you know, I know we've talked about the candidate side, but how, yeah. how do you, how do you or the corporation find you? Well, I think on the corporation side, the thing is it's very much on a, on a needs by needs basis. A lot of the time, these big companies have internal recruiters who are very much overseeing those processes for them. Um, I think, you know, where that differs from the startup process is, yeah, you have in a startup, you have a lot of technical people, but on the human resources side of things, they might not have those processes in place as of yet to be able to identify and secure candidates. So on the corporate side of things, where we come in is typically where they're looking to bring. And like I said, you know, maybe those C-suite candidates who um, an internal recruiter might not be able to reach out to simply because, they might have an existing business relationship from the company they're looking to headhunt from, or simply because it makes the market aware that, you know, they've got an open position, which is available. Um, we incorporate a level of anonymity when dealing with these, I guess, enterprise level clients to their recruitment processes, whereby, you know, we reach out to candidates speculatively, um, identify their interest and opportunities, and then we initiate those processes. But, you know, I would typically engage with a corporate level client when I've got a very specific kind of candidate within my network. And then it's just a case of marketing that to those to those clients. They might come back saying, you know, we're not looking for a director of engineering right now, um, but we're looking to bring in a blockchain CTO. So can you help us out with that requirement? That's that that's how that sort of relationship works. 
So um, I know here in the United States, um, it, it varies in terms of who pays. Uh, who pays you? Is it the corporation or is it the, the candidate? Well, we the candidates never pay us. I think that's, that's an important thing to get out of the way. Um, yeah. A lot of these people are young. A lot of them are looking to transition. And I think, you know, whilst we are working with companies, it's also important that we, we always have the candidate's best interests at heart. Um, so I wouldn't try to take somebody else from away from a job if I thought I wouldn't be able to get them an uplift on their current compensation or match exactly. their ambitions from a, from yeah. a career perspective. So um, I think, you know, on, 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 on that subject, we are, we're paid by the corporations. Yeah. Um, but we have two primary business models. The first one is our, our contingent service, whereby um, we initiate a search for a company. They come to us with requirements, and then we identify a multitude of candidates which match those skill sets. And then we only get paid on delivery um, in that sort of situation. Um, the thing about the contingent services, it's great if you don't have an urgent need. But from our business perspective, you know, we always want to work with companies who are actively looking to hire. So our retainer is our primary, I guess, the core business model. Um, and with the retained service, you know, what, what the clients get is certain service level agreements. So we come to an understanding on timelines for the project. And I think, you know, that's where my project management background comes into play as well. Um, we, we agree on timelines for candidates to be received. So if you're looking to have a short list of five candidates per week, say, who match every single aspect of what you're looking for, we work in accordance to those timelines. Um, we have a retainer fee as well, um, which obviously if you've got any people listening and you want to discuss that, you know, please feel free to reach out and we can have a broader conversation. But um, on the retainer fee, that's to initiate searches. Um, it's good for us simply because we always look to allocate an adequate amount of time to each requirement we have on our desk. I think if you've got a lot of contingent business, it's very difficult to deliver adequately on every single requirement. And we do have a lot of clients who pay us retainers um, to initiate searches for them. So beyond those certain service level agreements, like I said, we also um, act as brand ambassadors for the business as well. So if you're primarily looking to, I guess, source candidates, but you're also looking to drum up business relationships, um, we can facilitate those processes as well. So um, why don't you go ahead and mention again how people can contact you? This would be a good time for that. Yeah, of course, of course. So we've, we've got a few different mediums for contact right now. I think that the general or the main one is our, is our company website, which is uh, enterprisedigitalresources.com. But, you know, we've also got a company page on LinkedIn, which is Enterprise Digital Resources, as well as our own professional LinkedIn recruiter accounts as well. So you can contact me directly at Robert Edwards on LinkedIn. And all you need to do in terms of companies type in the name Enterprise Digital Resources, and I should come up on your search as well. Um, or you could reach out to me via email on robert.edwards at edr-gs.com. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about another area that I love, which is the travel side. Um, with the companies that you're working with, um, are they, do they seem to be located in any particular part of the world have more heavily than others, even though you, you sort of mentioned- Well, I would, I, would, I would probably say with, within the blockchain space, it's heavily weighted towards the US, primarily obviously we're looking at reasons like Silicon Valley. I think that's where a lot of the tech companies tend to be based, San Francisco. Um, and then over here in Europe as well, there's also a number of, of, of blockchain startups and then obviously in Asia as well. So in terms of the client base, like I said, you know, it's very much globally distributed, obviously with, I guess, the heavier weighting towards, towards the US. Also, out of curiosity, um, what is the age of most of the candidates that you seem to be placing? And that's a very interesting question, because I would say a lot of the guys that we're coming across, you know, when we're having these conversations are, are quite young. Um, a lot of them are early to mid 20s, you know, they've, they've got software development experience. And I think, you know, if you're looking to get into the blockchain space, definitely, I would always encourage, you know, as a starter, taking a few courses online. It's, believe it or not, it's not entirely that hard to, I guess, get your foot in the door within the industry. Um, and beyond, once you've had the opportunity to get a few certifications, the next real big thing is open source contributions. Um, so going on platforms like GitHub, it's a really good it's a really good platform. If you're looking to also engage with some of these crypto companies, um, you can make you can make open source contributions whereby you you I guess contribute pieces of code towards their overall software development programs. And if you're a good coder, you know you get a lot of people follow you on GitHub. 
and that's how you build a reputation within the industry because i think you know it is a really small industry and if you can develop a good reputation where it travels quite quickly um you go from becoming a contributor to a, a core contributor and then you might even have one or two companies look to pick you up based on the work you're doing on those open source projects so another question that popped into my mind um we talked about the age what about gender how many you know what are you finding in terms of the balance between men and women yeah, of course i think you know and i think it's within i think the blockchain space is very much reflective of the software space as a whole but i think blockchain is unique in that obviously it's it's, it's much newer technology uh, we come across a lot of male candidates i think blockchain is very much a, a male dominated space however there are a lot of fantastic women um, working within the industry right now i think you know from my perspective i'd love to have a lot more conversations with women um, who are not just you know technical or software developers but also have got those you know product focused backgrounds as well because um, there are a lot of different ways which you can break into the industry and i think you know a lot of people might get turned off um, by the fact that you know there's a lot of coding involved it's the technology itself it's new it's it's some people see it as volatile um, so there's there's that apprehensiveness breaking into the space but i think you know definitely there's there's always an opportunity for women in blockchain um i've got a lot of clients you know um, who say to me if you can find us female candidates that would be fantastic because the office is very much male dominated and you... <laughs> i i'm i'm very much about empowering everyone but i'm also always curious my because my background is also as an educator in addition to being an attorney so i'm always thinking about these questions on both sides and I, I do think that we need to be educating the, like I mentioned, the next generation um, to be thinking out of the box and what the the new technology, well, not this is not new technology, but what the the technology is offering. Um, Scotland, you're in Scotland. I love visiting Scotland. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, where are places that you would now that travel is picking back up? um you know give or take with uh the the permissions to travel where would you um suggest that people kind of hop in and visit and explore yeah i think you know one thing i love about scotland as a whole is it's, it's very much a picturesque country i think yeah. if we're talking about you know vegetation life light um life in general it's it's probably one of the richest places within within europe i would say um from, from my perspective, I quite like going up north. It's uh, the landscapes that are absolutely fantastic. You know, if you're going to places um, like, like, like Aberdeen, mm -hmm. Inverness, you get a lot of very picturesque landscapes. A lot. It's really good if you enjoy hiking as well. You know, there are a lot of hiking and nature trails out there as well. Um, one place I quite like is, is, is a place called Loch Lomond. I think that's the biggest lake in Scotland, if not the UK, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's a really good tourist attraction, especially during the summertime. You get boat cruises, um, campfires, restaurants. Um, it's, it's a really lovely place. And then if we're taking it, I guess, you know, a little bit further down south, Edinburgh itself is a fantastic city. Um, it's, it's, it's a very young and vibrant place as well, which I think is one of the core reasons why EDR was established here. We've got probably about four or five different universities within the city. It's, mm -hmm. it's very much a student town. Um, but you've also, you know, you've got a blend of people from different backgrounds. So within Edinburgh, it's very much a, a cultural hub of, of the UK. We've got the Fringe Festival, which is typically on, I think, around July, August every year. Um, if you haven't been to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, you're absolutely missing out. It's one of the biggest cultural experiences I'm saying you're going to find anywhere. It's, it's a blend of you know, music, art, fashion, um, comedy. You've got people coming over from the US as well who are maybe comedians. Um, they've got a few shows going on over here in the in Scotland and beyond that you know we've also got we've got Arthur's seat which is the highest point in the city you can pretty much have a view of the whole of Edinburgh up there and I think it's in terms of landmarks it's probably the biggest one in the city that's great you 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 brought something up during your um discussion about universities from your perspective um as a recruiter and in that business are universities doing enough to provide the training for the, the next level of where we want these um, graduation student graduating students to go and for companies that are developing new areas? What are your yeah, thoughts I mean, about I, that? Of course, of course. I think, you know, 
it's probably good to know as well. I, I went to, to university in Edinburgh, so I've got a pretty good understanding of, of the landscape here. And I think the value of the university, which I went to, which is Harriet Watt University, is it's, it's very much tech focused. Um, engineering, software development is at, at the core of everything that they do. But I think as a whole, I would say um, educational institutes could definitely be doing more to make students aware of the potential opportunities that are available within this space. I think, you know, where the challenge comes in play is um, there's not a lot of regulation around blockchain technology and a lot of people who are teaching at universities um, are more accustomed to traditional tech stacks. Um, they might not be as aware of, you know, the space in itself, the technology, what the real life implications and applications of, of the technology are. So I think, you know, incorporating educational sessions around blockchain, crypto, the different applications of it, the technology would definitely be beneficial from an educational standpoint because it is very much the future of everything that we're going to do i think you know we look at security as a whole um and tech and tech as well there's there's not been a lot of processes put in place over the years which can adequately verify um transactions and ensure that you know um everything is according to the status is according to the status quo when, when you're doing things online um so the technology in itself is has fantastic applications moving forward and i think you know it would be a really big shame if universities don't catch on to that trend because when i speak to a lot of developers you know they might come from software engineering backgrounds but ultimately they're not doing blockchain at university um they might go back for a, for a postgraduate degree where that's the core focus but definitely within the undergraduate space i would say um there definitely needs to be more emphasis on that yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, and that's exactly why I created the NFT Academy Rolodex, because I I see that there's a gap at the moment. Um, there are some name brand universities who are creating these certificates, but I'm not seeing that um, the attempt to educate um, students at various levels on the developments that are going on both commerce wise as well as technologically is happening and I think that we're going to get there's going to be a, a gap um, and so there will be people who are creative like those that are in the gaming area and other areas that um, just naturally gravitate towards um, the development but I I want individuals that might not be familiar with just like how crypto has become more widespread in terms of public knowledge, you know, when PayPal and other um, traditional institutions start to incorporate it, then people think, okay, oh, well, now maybe I should look at it. I, I want the students of today to be looking at this thinking, this is the direction that companies might be going, are going, you know, and so they can see that it's a uh, an actual um, career path that they can consider. So I truly appreciate um, everything that you and your company are doing uh, because I think it's creating a very vibrant community um, and that type of exchange from all over the world. People need to know, you know, um, about what you're doing. Um, any last minute thoughts that you want to share with the listeners? Um, yeah, of course. And I, th I think this probably goes out to the people who are maybe still a little bit tentative on i guess moving into the space and what i'm going to say is change is change is inevitable change is at the forefront of everything we do i think you know trade today is not how trade was 500 years ago and i think we need to adapt and you know what what blockchain allows is an opportunity for young people to move into or not even just young people people who are, who are open-minded to move into a space that's primarily untapped and become a key contributor if you're if you know if you're looking to make a career change or move into the space this is the best time to do so um it's once i guess the market becomes a little bit more mature you're going to be in a situation whereby it's very much client driven i think if you're someone who has the adequate skill sets right now the opportunities are fantastic and i think you know with covid there there are no benefits but you know if i was to look at one thing that's that's changed because of the current situation is the opportunities for remote working you know um, I have a lot of conversations with people who are in developing countries who, you know, typically there, there might not be any real path out. And what this situation allows now is the opportunity to engage with internationally um, credited companies who will offer you opportunities to be part of products and, 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 and I guess projects which are going to be um, life changing, you know, and with that in itself, obviously, there comes relocation opportunities. Um, so if you're if you're really looking to get 
get into a space whereby there's not a lot of competition right now, whereby you're going to have opportunities to grow and also grow your earning potential as well. Because I think, you know, for blockchain developers, um, a guy who's got two years experience and a guy who's got five years experience, the earning potential is significantly different. And so I think, you know, it's a really fantastic, I guess, space to move into. If you're someone who's driven, someone who's open to, to new opportunities and you really want to, I guess, be part of real world change. I agree with you. Um, and as we know, you've mentioned the two and the five year mark. Five years goes by very fast. So, very fast. <laughs> so definitely. Um, why don't you go ahead and mention again how people can contact you? Yeah, of course. So if you'd be looking to get in touch with us, there's a few different mediums. You can reach us on our company website, which is enterprisedigitalresources.com. Um, we've also got our company LinkedIn page at Enterprise Digital Resources. Um, you can also reach me on LinkedIn, which is Robert Edwards at Enterprise Digital Resources, or even reach me via email at robert.edwards at edr-gs.com. Yeah. So everyone, thank you so much uh, for, for listening to Crypto Mom 2. Uh, there will be some tag on um, information pieces and possibly even some music because of uh, some of the artists that I also am trying to help and support. So listen to the end. You might hear some wonderful violin music. And thank you so much, Robert, for being on. I look forward to future conversations. And I also look forward to connecting with you to, to share all the wonderful discoveries of people that I've been meeting and possibly connecting them with you. Um, so that way they, their dreams can also be achieved as well. So thank you so Definitely. much for being on. Definitely. And thank you for having me on the show, Jackie. Honestly, it was, it was an absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward to, uh, I guess, engaging with you further in the future, having conversations with some of these really interesting people and seeing where, you know, we can help them achieve their dreams. Exactly. Exactly. This is a very exciting time for all of us. All right. Talk to you soon. And everyone, have a great day. Have a good day. Bye-bye.